welcome. This is an amazing time that we're living in and we are delighted to have you with us today. On behalf of the Board of Directors, the 125 member theaters, our affiliated artists and ambassadors from across the country, welcome. Welcome to NNPN's annual conference and to our first audience, audience engagement summit. Um, obviously, this is not how we had planned on being together, but we are delighted that there are so many of you joining us. We have over 300 people registered for events this week, and we want to encourage you to join us for as many things that are possible and the things that you find of interest, both our um, artistic offerings and our programmatic offerings. Um, I'm joining you today from West Palm Beach, Florida, which is the unceded territories of the Tequesta and Seminole people. Um, and we want to acknowledge that. We also want to remind you to pin your program book. Jess has put it in the chat there for you. That uh, conference program will give you all sorts of information about the people that you'll be seeing. And we're going to kick off with an amazing group of people. But before we do, I just want to say uh, a huge, huge thank you to NNPN staff. Um, those of you who are new to us or just joining us, um, maybe haven't spent a lot of time with the gang here, um, I think we'll be astounded to learn that there are four of us. and. The programming that we have put together for you this weekend has, or this week, is directly attributed to those people. Um, Jess Hutchinson, our engagement manager, uh, Jordana Freider, our programs director, and Rose Figueroa, who uh, is here with me in West Palm and serves as our administrative coordinator. So a huge thank you to them and all the panelists and moderators and uh, artists who will be joining us for this week to bring you uh, what we hope will be a very exciting uh, and informative, as well as artistically satisfying uh, group of offerings. So we're gonna go now and get this kicked off, right? We're gonna get started. So I'm gonna toss to Jess, who's gonna do a little bit of the Zoomiverse language definitions and usages for us as we begin today. Jess? Hi, thanks, Nan. Hi, everybody. So excited to see so many folks joining us from all over. I'm just here to say a little bit about Zoom, um, just in case you have not been spending uh, most of your time on Zoom. Uh, we are using the webinar version of Zoom today for this presentation. That means all of our attendees have been muted, but there are a couple of different ways that you can communicate with us and with each other, and I hope that you will. I see some of you are already using the chat. Um, in the chat, make sure there's that blue box above where you type your message, and you can click the little carrot guy there and make sure that if you're sending messages to the room, which we encourage you to do through this session, just make sure you've clicked all panelists and attendees. If you need something technical, if something is something funky is happening and you need me, you can either chat to all panelists and I'll see it. I'm going to be keeping an eye on the chat or you can uh, use that same menu to chat directly to me and let me know what you need. Uh, the other function I want to make sure you know about is the Q&A box. That's where you can type in any of your questions for this panel throughout the time uh, that we're chatting today. There are I'm going to be some presentations from the panel at the beginning. If you have a clarifying question about something the panelists have said, feel free to chat that in the box, um, uh, into the Q&A box and put QC at the beginning of that for clarifying, or CQ, excuse me, for clarifying question um, so that we know that it's something we should look at uh, to make sure we have our context, our context right. Uh, if you have a, a more general or a, a pondery question, we'll have a Q&A section at the end of our session. So we'll, we'll save some of those questions for later. You'll also notice that you'll be able to see each other's questions. And if someone asks a question that you're super interested in having answered, you can upvote that by clicking on the little thumbs up. Um, also want to let you know that this session is being recorded, uh, just to let you know that. 
And uh, yes, and like I said, we encourage you to, to chat with your, with your fellow uh, participants and to ask questions. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Back to you, Nan. Great, here we go. Session number one of this giant experiment that we're on of a virtual conference. Uh, I am delighted to bring you guys this amazing group of people. This is a question that I've been thinking about a lot uh, since this all began as, you know, storytelling is as old as humankind and we've been through this before in various forms. So I wanted to, uh, I kept asking the question and I know other people have as well. How has this happened in the past? How did we get through it? How did we come back? And we have assembled this amazing group of people who are gonna chat with you today and tell you about the pieces of, um, of history that they've been focusing on uh, as we move to find our way forward. So I'm delighted to bring to you today uh, a friend and a, a wonderful, wonderful asset to our industry, the amazing Julie Dubiner, who's joining us uh, today and will talk to you about the rest of the planet. So ladies and gentlemen, freelance dramaturg and super cool, fabulous girl, Julie Dubiner. Here we go. I, I will attempt to be fabulous. Uh, as Nan said, I'm, I'm Julie Fleece Dubiner, she, her, hers, and I'm greeting you today from Ashland, Oregon, which is uh, the home of the Tacoma, Lagawa, Shasta, Applegate River, Athabascan, Dakubatebe, and uh, also currently the home of the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz and the Confederated Tribes of, Cran <laughs> of Cranron. And we have a special guest. Um, uh, today we're, uh, we've been talking a lot uh, amongst ourselves and uh, I'm very excited to share with you the panelists that I've had the joy of getting to know their work and living in their scholarship for the last couple of days. Uh, so uh, everyone just take it away. We're gonna, everyone just introduce yourselves. Hi. <laughs> Look at those beautiful people. <laughs> I'm Edwin Wong, and I'm uh, saying hi from Victoria, Canada to everyone. Thank you to everyone for coming to this event. Hey, I'll jump in. I'm Tanya Palmer, um, and I'm coming to you from Bloomington, Indiana, um, where I teach at the at Indiana University. I'm Carrie Kaplan. Um, I'm coming to you from Austin, Texas. Um, I'm the dramaturg and literary manager uh, for Austin Community College here in Texas, as well as an educational researcher. I am Sally. I paused in the hopes that the baby behind me would be quiet. Um, so hopefully that will happen soon. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I'm speaking to you from uh, Seattle, which is the unceded territory of the Duwamish people. Uh, and I'm the Associate Artistic Director of the Bearded Ladies Cabaret, which is based out of Philadelphia, the unceded territory of the Lenni Lenape. We're gonna start by having some fun. Um, as Nan mentioned, uh, we asked the panelists to prepare a small presentation on their, their topics. But when we spoke yesterday, we couldn't really decide what order to go in. So we're gonna play rock, paper, scissors. So uh, first up is Edwin versus Carrie, and I will do the count off. You ready? One, two, three, go. Okay. Oh. oh. Rock, break, scissors. All right, Edwin, you decide who goes first. Rock always prevails. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm thrilled to be here with everyone discussing a most timely question that's on all of our minds, which is how can theater become essential to our communities? Thank you very much for facilitating, Julie. And I'm so happy to be here with uh, my fellow panelists, Carrie, Tanya, and Sally. My name is Edwin Wong, 
And here's my background. I approach theater from the perspective of a classicist from uh, ancient Greek and Roman studies. And the classics, uh, they, they do tell us a bit about how people reacted. So in 430 BC, there was the plague of Athens, which ended up taking out about a third of the population. And what we see is in 429, Sophocles produced his masterwork, Oedipus the King, a play which questions society's values and also faith. So in some periods of history, theater has been a powerful tool to reimagine how we can go forwards. And for that to happen, the playwrights, the theaters, and also the audiences have to have the courage to keep going forwards. My teachers in the classics were Laurel Bowman at the University of Victoria and David Constant at Brown University. My specialty is the theory of tragedy. These days, I've been working on an annual playwriting contest with Langham Court Theatre in Victoria, Canada. The Risk Theatre Playwriting Competition is the world's largest contest for the writing of tragedy. Last year's winning play was In Bloom by someone some of you know well, Brooklyn playwright Gabriel Jason Dean. Through the competition, Langham Court offers the community a forum to explore the role of chance and the unexpected in theater and in life. We fly in the winner for a workshop and staged reading. Langham Court is an essential part of our community here in Victoria because of the personal connections the competition fosters within our city here of 370,000 and with playwrights and theater people from all over the world. I'm very proud to be part of this competition and to be working with Michelle Buck at Langham Court Theater, Michael Armstrong, the competition manager, and board member Keith Digby. The contest is based on my award-winning book on theory. It's called The Risk Theater Model of Tragedy. It reimagines tragedy as a theater of risk. It's risk and not catharsis or collision that drives the action. Because we're surrounded by the impact of the highly improbable, the competition invites playwrights to write plays that dramatize unintended consequences and the impact of low probability, high consequence events. Audiences today clamor to learn more about the impact of risk. And I think the theater is a perfect stage to simulate risk. And when theaters produce new plays based on a modern theory of drama, I believe that theaters can connect powerfully with community. To remember the past, we continue the conversation with the past by writing new theories and new plays. But what a lot of people say to me these days, and perhaps some of you are thinking, is who wants tragedy? Enough of tragedy already. We cannot think of tragedy while living through it. And this sentiment is straight from Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, a story of fellow travelers exchanging stories. Whenever one of the travelers tells a tragedy, the rest of them put a stop to it. They say, this is too sad. We insist that you stop immediately. 
And people write into me because I have this competition. They write in all the time saying, why do you have a tragedy competition during a crisis? But what I also see is this. People who have heard about my theory of drama based on low probability, high consequence events are fascinated and want to learn more. And here's a thought. If you market a play as a tragedy, you'll be met with disdain. But if you market a play as an exploration of risk, audiences clamor for more. To me, tragedy and risk are synonymous, the same thing. All of drama is a dramatization of risk. And that's why we have two genres, comedy to dramatize upside risk and tragedy to dramatize downside risk. But it's not the same to audiences. And this brings me to my last point. The theaters, which are essential to their communities, will find creative ways to pitch their shows to audiences to pique their curiosity. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Edwin. Carrie, are you ready? Can you see my screen? We got it. Okay. Okay. Um, so I have kind of two obsessions. I am obsessed with anti-theatrical pamphlets, um, particularly from the Renaissance. Um, and as an education researcher, I actually research empathy. Um, and the neuroscience behind it and how empathy can actually be taught because it is something that can be taught. Um, and I'm going to try to bring those two very disparate interests together and hopefully leave y'all um, with a little bit of hope coming out of here today. Um, I wanna give you a content warning. I am, I am going to be talking about plague death. Um, so I thought maybe we could start, oops, what have I done? With a little bit of levity. Um, Perhaps you've seen the meme that is all over Twitter now of what we thought was going to happen this year and what this year actually is. So here on the left, we have some folks gathered at the Globe for a Shakespeare performance. Um, Shakespeare wrote the Scottish play in 2006 um, during a particularly nasty outbreak of plague. And I'm sure for many of us, uh, Lady M and her iconic hand washing has sort of been on our minds quite a bit um, of late. So I want to give you just a little bit of an overview um, of how significantly the plague impacted theater um, in Shakespeare's time and, and the wider resonant, um, Renaissance, um, just because it's actually pretty amazing that they achieved, you know, what they did, that it's, you know, they didn't just survive, they thrived. Um, so the Black Plague, the Bubonic Plague, the Great Death, the Great Plague, um, it first shows up in England around the mid 1300s. And basically from then until 1666, which is the end of the last outbreak, um, it comes back. So basically for three centuries, um, they're facing the plague. The worst outbreaks and kind of most contemporary to what I wanna talk about is in the, the mid 1500s to, the, to 1665, 66. So just to give you a sense, by 1563 in that outbreak, there were a thousand people dying of the plague per week just in London, um, just in London alone. Um, they start publishing the Bills of Mortality in 1603, so that's where they're logging how many deaths there are, and they do it by parish, so you can see kind of where the deaths are located. Between then and 1666, um, there are only four years, between 1603 and 1606, where there are no rep reported plague deaths, um, so it's a pretty rough time. And that last outbreak is the worst. Um, from 1665 to six, 100,000 people died of the plague just in London. Um, so those are the numbers of where we're at currently um, for the entire US for COVID. So imagine it's those numbers, but it is just the city of London. They lost a quarter of their population during that time. Um, and this has a major impact on theater. So basically the kind of rule of thumb, um, is that every time there are more than 30 deaths a week or possibly 40, the playhouses have to shut down. Um, and to give you just a sense of the magnitude of that, um, between the time they started recording the Bills of Mortality in 1603, um, 10 years later in 1613, 
the playhouses are shut down for 78 months of that time period. So that is more than half of that 10 year chunk. Um, you cannot stage a play, the, the, the theaters are closed. Um, and on top of the sort of epidemiological risk um, that the Black play brought um, in the challenge to theaters, there's also strong anti-theatrical sentiments coming from political um, religious pundits, um, mainly Puritans, who most people kind of dismissed them as zealots, but they went and took over the government in 1642, um, and theaters are banned entirely from 1642 um, to 1660 when the monarchy is restored um, and Charles returns in 1661. Uh, so that's pretty significant. Um, if you think about, you know, we associate like so much of the Western canon with this time period, and these are the circumstances that folks were working under. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to get into the techniques that they used to sort of survive this, but I'd be happy to kind of pick that up in a QA. and a um, So this is one place I find hope. The other place I find hope is in the anti-theatrical writing itself. So folks who hate the theater, um, who want to and succeed in shutting it down entirely for that interregnum period. Um, this is basically called the pamphlet wars and it stretches kind of same time period I'm looking at. It's not a surprise. The plague was horrible and scary and people wanted something to blame and theater was a real easy target. Um, so there was just this outpouring of people basically like manifestoing each other, like pamphlet at you, pamphlet back at you. Um, men, women, all kinds of people were involved in it. And this chunk specifically folks were writing about the theater. Um, and their basic thought was that theater kind of is a plague. Um, theater is the reason why we have plague. Plague is punishment from God. Uh, God punishes sin. Going to the theater is a sin. And they really lean into that metaphor. Um, they think that theater, you know, kind of gets in through the eyes and the ears um, the same way that plague does, and that it can corrupt, you know, your body, your mind, and your eternal soul. Um, it's this pretty interesting magical thinking that they really sort of felt like you know, if you watch something, it'll make you want to do it. And if you do it, you will become it, um, which a lot of people have sort of laughed at and made fun of. Um, but I kind of think they were onto something. Um, just to tell you a little bit about who's writing this stuff, a lot of the pamphleteers actually started out as playwrights or poets, um, and they weren't very good. Um, or I guess they had a come to Jesus moment where they decided no more theater, um, sort of like Plato famously burning his uh, tragedy. Um, before he began to write against theater. Um, and the other really funny thing about these pamphlets that just kills me is that even though they're criticizing the theater and saying we got to shut it down, it's the plague, it's death, um, they write in theatrical forms. Um, so one of the first ones, John Northbrook's A Treatise Against Dicing, Dancing, Plays, and Interludes, um, he writes it as a dialogue be told between old men and youth. So he writes a play um, to criticize plays. And you know, a few other examples of that, um, Gossin, who writes one of the, the bigger ones, it's called Plays Confuted in Five Acts, and it's exactly what it sounds like. He takes a five act dramatic structure to rail against the theater. So it starts to seem like maybe the call is coming from inside the house to some degree. Um, I just wanna unpack their arguments a little bit, um, and then I'll kind of wrap up and move us over to empathy. So here are just some quotes. You don't have to read through all this. These writings are very misogynist. Um, they're particularly concerned that women um, are gonna be susceptible to this. And God forbid when women actually get on the stage um, that they're going to arouse emotion that's gonna carry over. Um, so Northbrook says, you know, if women go out and they understand what other people are doing, they're gonna get curious and that's real bad for women. Um, they might start to question their station they might leave the house and not be where they're supposed to be. Um, they're xenophobic, so there's a lot of anxiety about theater being foreign, that it was an Italian or a Roman import. Um, they write long, like hundreds and hundreds of pages just getting mad about like Italian books and French shoes, cork, and things like that. Um, England goes through the four major wars in this time period, so there's definitely a fear of kind of invading others, and theater kind of slots into that. And then above and beyond all else, homophobic. Um, there's a terror about men dressing in women's clothing um, and even just folks watching men dressed in women's clothing. Because again, following that logic, it's like if you see something, you're gonna imitate it. If you imitate it, you will become it. Um, so they felt that you know, actors who put on women's clothing and played women's roles were basically perverting their own gender. Um, and that if an audience member watched that, it would have the same power to do that. 
again, they got a lot of flack for that. Um, but I think it's pretty interesting. They actually ascribe a lot of power to theater. Um, they're saying that theater can do something, that the act of going to the theater is a radical act. Um, and it's scary to think about the plague, um, but the plague does show us how we're connected to other people. It reminds us that our bodies are permeable, that things can come in and out of them and can kind of reconstitute them. Um, and these anti-theatricalists are saying the exact same thing, that fear can do the same. And really, I think we can say, yes, the theater does corrupt, but we might think about what is it they're saying when they're saying the theater corrupts? What is corruption? Um, and to me, it really reads like a contemporary neuroscience-based description of how empathy works in the body. Um, that researchers are finding that we build empathy through activating our mirror neurons, which you can do by watching and then experiencing somebody else's emotions, even more so if you step in to somebody else's shoes literally through play acting. Um, you might not be surprised that whether it's in therapeutic situations, social work, um, work with autistic children who often have trouble expressing empathy, um, they use theatrical techniques to build, to get those mirror neurons to fire. And the more you use those neurons, the more empathetic, the more capacity you have for empathy. Um, and so literally, you know, you are put, walking into somebody else's shoes, you are letting in the stories, the emotions of others, um, and you are kind of radically reconstituting who you are. You are bringing otherness into yourself and, you know, letting it make you a better person. So, you know, I can go on and on about these tracks. They're absolutely bananas, um, absolutely bonkers, but I think they're some of the greatest love letters um, that have ever been written to the theater. Um, and I think they very firmly argue that theater is essential to knowing who we are, um, to understanding who other people are and making community around that. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Edwin's book is, Gracie Kett really wants to be part of this today. Uh, Edwin's book is available uh, all over the place and um, I'm really looking forward. I, I, we had the gift of being able to read the first chapter draft of uh, Carrie's dissertation. There's Edwin's book. Um, and I'm really looking forward to, to reading the whole thing when, when it's done, no pressure. Um, <laughs> Uh, and now, rock, paper, scissors between Tanya and Sally. You ready? Okay. All right, Sally. So we're going on go, right? Okay. Yep. One, One two, two, three, three go. go. Oh, we tied. Oh, paper. All right. One, One, two, three, go. <laughs> <You stop. laughs> One last time and then two. Three, go. We're just, we're too connected. Really? <laughs> All right. All right. Well, uh, and I will just decide and I will say, Tanya, you go first and then we'll hear from Sally. Does that sound all right? Yep. Sounds good. Um, okay. So I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this will work. Okay, can you see my screen? Great. Um, so, you know, I have, like a lot of people, have been thinking about um, the question of, you know, what theater looks like in the wake of a pandemic and um, was thinking about the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. And the first story that came into my mind was the story of the founding of the Goodman Theater, which is where I worked for 15 years as the um, director of new play development. And, um, you know, and this theater really had its origins in this pandemic in an interesting way. So I want to talk a little bit about um, that and sort of weave in the story of what was happening before Chicago, before the creation of the Goodman in Chicago theater and, and afterwards. And hopefully I'll be able to do it in not a crazy amount of time. All right, so I'm going to start. Um, so as I said, the, the Goodman Theater had its origins in the 1918 pandemic. It's named for Kenneth Sawyer Goodman, who died in 1918. Um, he was born into a wealthy family uh, and grew up in Hyde Park, attended Princeton, where he started writing plays. And when he came back to Chicago uh, in 1906, he entered the family lumber business 
but he continued to work, um, you know, at night and on, you know, in his spare time in the little theater movement that was developing in Chicago in the early 1900s. Um, and the movement sought to produce more authentic experimental work uh, than some of the commercial work that was happening at the time and featured amateur actors and playwrights. Um, from 1910 until his death, Goodman wrote, directed, and acted in a number of plays in Chicago and collaborated on work with um, Ben Hecht, who many of you may know from the, the play Front Page. Um, and it was during this time that Goodman began to formulate plans for a theater that would combine a repertory company with a dramatic art school um, made up with faculty who would be actors in the company. And this was really coming from a couple places, I think. One was a desire to come up with a sustainable model for these little theaters, these sort of art theaters, how to actually create a way in which they could support themselves. And also he was really interested specifically in finding a place for theater um, to be showcased in its city like at institutions like the Art Institute of Chicago, for example, as a place to showcase the work of theatrical uh, art. Um, so after his death uh, from, so he, he was also a, a lieutenant in the Naval Reserve Force. And in 1918, while attending a football game in Annapolis, he contracted the influenza and died later at the home of his parents. And so, um, you know, because he came from a wealthy family, his parents were able to make good on Kenneth Sawyer Goodman's vision. And they donated $350,000 to the Art Institute to create the Kenneth Sawyer Goodman Memorial Theater in his honor. Um, he had, you know, this was something that he had envisioned. He'd written a letter to the Art Institute in 1916 proposing this uh, theater and, and school. Um, and so when it was built in and ultimately opened in 1925, it had a severe tomb-like Greek classic facade with the theater's uh, goal stated up top to restore the old visions and to win the new. Um, okay, but before I go into the Goodman's history, I wanna talk a little bit about the before time um, and the little theater movement and its origins in Chicago to kind of weave together what the vision that Kenneth Sawyer Goodman was trying to recreate or trying to create in this larger theater was. Um, and specifically going back to Jane Addams and Hull House, which was founded in 1889. Um, and it, Jane Addams was a pioneer so, uh, social worker who was inspired by Toynbee Hall, which was a neighborhood center she'd visited in London. And she turned an old mansion on Chicago's west side into a place that offered a day nursery, health care, employment services, as well as a swimming pool, gymnasium, circulating library, public kitchen, and a theater. Um, the Hull House Players, which was the resident company uh, at Hull House, was uh, considered to be the first little theater in the United States. Um, it was one of just many artistic and cultural activities at the Hull House. Um, Hull House started offering classes and staging plays in the late 1890s, including some of the earliest American productions of work by Shaw, Ibsen, Lady Gregory, and they performed to audiences of immigrants from Ireland, Germany, Italy, Bohemia, Greece, Russia, Poland, and Mexico, who all were uh, the residents of the community around where Hull House stood. And I just, uh, appreciated this quote from Todd London from his book, Ideal Theater. Hull House reminds us that ethnic, racial, and cultural diversity was an originating premise of our theater, not a late 20th century concept applied after the fact. So here are just a few quotes from Jane Addams, who's pictured here um, and her reflecting on the theater. Um, the theater such as it was appeared to be the one agency which freed boys and girls from the destructive isolation of those who dragged themselves up to maturity by themselves and it gave them a glimpse of the order and beauty into which even the poorest drama endeavors to restore the bewildering facts of life. Um, she described how, you know, there was a variety of work produced on the stages um, from classic Greek work actually produced by the Greek immigrants who lived in that community. Um, to uh, dramas in the native languages of the immigrant communities there, to new work that sort of reflected the immigrant experience in America. Um, and she described how uh, through 
her, her observation was through such plays, the stage became a pioneer teacher of social righteousness. So just a little more broadly to uh, talk about the little theater movement in Chicago. And sorry, this is jam packed with text. Um, so as I said, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, little theaters uh, sprang up all around Chicago with the goal of offering more non-commercial original works by both local playwrights and um, the avant-garde drama coming out of Europe. Notably, the premiere of Ibsen's Ghosts happened in Chicago in a, in a little theater. Um, there were also kind of major institutions that grew up around this time, uh, including um, a Yiddish theater that, that offered both local work and um, touring companies. Uh, the Pekin building, which was the uh, described itself as the finest and largest black owned theater in the United States and had a resident acting company. Pilsen's Talia Hall, uh, which presented work in the original Czech language. And another organization, which is now I'm going to pull back into Kenneth Sawyer Goodman, is uh, the Chicago Little Theater, which whose goal was to establish a repertory uh, and experimental art theater. And they were housed in the Fine Arts Building and you know, struggled to find a way of sustaining their work uh, financially, which was again, part of the kind of inspiration for Kenneth Sawyer Goodman um, to try to come up with a model that could sustain this kind of work. Um, so Kenneth Sawyer Goodman's plays were showcased uh, by the Chicago Little Theater. Here's an example of a uh, play that he wrote called Back of the Yards and one that he co-wrote with Ben Hecht called The Wonder Hat. And he wrote all kinds of different short plays. Um, okay, so coming back to the Goodman. Um, the Goodman was established in 1925 and uh, they named Thomas Wood Stevens as the director of the theater. He'd been a collaborator and friend of Kenneth Sawyer Goodman. Um, and the Goodman was both a school and a professional repertory company. Uh, Stevens had already created the first degree granting program at the Carnegie Institute in 1913. And his goal was to create a place for experimentation and learning, a professional school of the art of theater that combined with a producing repertory company that presents productions of plays as dramatic art. They admitted their first class in 1925. Here's a picture from one of their first productions of that season, Every Man. Um, they also presented three of Goodman's one act plays. Oh, sorry, jumping ahead of myself. Um, but by the, and you know, ultimately they produced 44 productions in the first five years of their existence. Um, but they were felled by the financial pressures of the Great Depression. By the 1929-30 season, the theater had a $35,000 uh, deficit, which was sort of unsustainable from the point of view of the Art Institute's board. Um, Stevens resigned and the following year, the professional company disbanded. And it wouldn't continue again until 1969, although the school continued and they also had a children's theater company. So unlike the 1918 epidemic, which in spite of its sobering death toll was ultimately in terms of its impact on the theater, broader impact on the theater, a kind of passing storm Theaters closed, um, there was financial pressure as a result, but then they reopened and there wasn't necessarily a lot of reflection on that time um, within the work of the theater. But the depression had a sort of, had a devastating effect on theater. Um, and I'm just gonna jump into the sort of final link that I wanna make, which is what came directly after the Great Depression, which was the uh, Federal Theater Project. And a lot of uh, folks who were involved in the Federal Theater Project in Chicago had been educated at the Goodman School of Drama. Um, this was, this is Hallie Flanagan who started uh, the Federal Theater Project. Um, she envisioned it as a federation of theaters subsidized nationally but administered locally. So there was a Chicago um, uh, office. And actually um, there had been a workers theater that was doing um, work that kind of echoed some of what would end up happening at the Federal Theater Project's Chicago unit that started in 1931. Um, but the Federal P Theater Project uh, was, uh, uh, oh, sorry, this is my spot. Um, the idea was that it was cheap, accessible to all, simultaneously local and universal, technologically sophisticated and reflective of the realities of the day, a national living theater as varied as the people in America. 
In her words, the Federal Theater is a pioneer theater because it is part of a tremendous rethinking and rebuilding and redreaming of America. Not merely a decoration, but a vital force in our democracy. Um, so here's just a couple of examples of some of the work that was produced by the Federal Theater. Swing Mikado had its origins in Chicago. Um, one Third of a Nation was one of the examples of the living newspapers, which were about contemporary events, um, and they would be kind of adapted for each place. So in Chicago, um, it was about, you know, lack of housing and they, they added text about the specific um, issues in Chicago housing. Um, they also did children's theater, they did reimaginings of classics and contemporary work. Um, here's another living newspaper. Um, and I just wanted to link this back to uh, Kenneth Sawyer Goodman because, you know, while the uh, Federal Theater Project ultimately died because of political pressure, um, it was ended in 1939 by an act of Congress who saw it as, you know, um, many of the conservative members saw it as communist propaganda, the work that they were doing. Um, but it really built a foundation through its uh, focus on building these regional offices and, and creating work that was employing artists and, you know, uh, created by and for the specific communities in which it was built. It created the kind of um, both appetite for and vision for, in many ways, the regional theater movement that happened in the mid 20th century, <coughs> which was when the Goodman was also reborn as a professional theater. Um, so I just wanted to end on this, what I find inspiring quote from Flanagan about when she was reflecting on the sort of legacy of the Federal Theater Project, um, where she says that significance lies in pointing to the future, the 10,000 anonymous men and women, the et cetera's and the so forths who did the work, the nobodies who were everybody, the somebodies who believed it. Their dreams and deeds were not the end. They were the beginning of a people's theater in a country whose greatest plays are still to come. That's so exciting. Let's all just have a moment for Hallie Flanagan. Um, <laughs> and uh, Sally, you ready to go? Hi, I'm Sally, um, and I'm going to move us uh, slightly away to, uh, from theater to cabaret, which is theater adjacent, um, sometimes quite literally. Uh, Moscow's first cabaret was in the basement of the State Theater, uh, and they would put on parody versions of the shows that were going on on the main floor, usually with like the same actors. Um, and a couple of caveats, I think, before I start. The first is that um, when I'm talking about cabaret, I'm not talking about burlesque and I'm not talking about vaudeville. And I'm happy to go into those distinctions um, as part of a Q&A or privately later. Uh, the big thing I think that applies is that those are both unique art forms with their own histories and I'm not really gonna be touching on them. Um, and the other thing is that cabaret is uh, started in Europe um, and then went further than that, but it is still a predominantly Western form. Uh, so when I'm talking about great world events and how cabaret has interacted with them, I'm generally speaking about Europe and sometimes the United States and a little bit Australia. Um, so uh, I think what's one of the things that's fascinating to me about cabaret is that it maps pretty closely to some of the major trauma points um, of the 20th century. It tends to, when I first started doing this research, which was about four years ago, um, I started by thinking that it was popping up, cabaret tended to pop up around moments of, uh, moments of socio-political upheaval, moments that were coming out of or directly leading into a crisis. And recently I've started to think of it more uh, as moments when people really need uh, joy and moments where people really need a release. And I think that those things are probably related. <laughs> um, but I think for me, the distinction of, uh, of joy versus trauma um, felt important. So what do I mean by cabaret pops up in those moments? Uh, cabaret has a very distinct uh, start point and that start point is 1881 uh, and the place is Le Chat Noir. Uh, if you've all seen that poster that hangs on everybody's um, college dorm room, that's from Le Chat Noir. Uh, and it, it's really the idea of one man 
and his name is, oh, and I'm gonna butcher all foreign languages, so I apologize. His name is uh, Rodolf Salih, and he is uh, not a great poet, but he is a very good bar owner. And so he realizes that um, he can open his bar in an area of Paris. It's actually at this point right outside of Paris um, called Montmartre. Somebody, you just say the way it's supposed to sound in your head. Um, and uh, which is at that time um, still relatively rural and still primarily the place where uh, folks of the working class are living. And I think most importantly, 10 years earlier, it was also the site of the most brutal pieces of the putting down of the Paris Commune. Um, and so he's building this bar on a site of um, citywide trauma. Um, and he's building it with people who had participated, who had been the victims um, of that oppression, um, who at the time that he's building his bar are being employed by the city to build um, that beautiful temple of Sacre Coeur, which I'm sure some of you have seen or really identify with Lamont at this time. And the reason they're building it is primarily because Paris wants to keep those working class people busy um, so that they don't have time to dream up any more communes. And so this is the site where Salih decides that he's going to put his bar. Um, and he invites all of his literary friends and all of his musician friends. And their idea is that they're going to um, come to this bar, they're gonna share their art with each other um, and they're gonna buy drinks. And that's as, far as, that's as far as he had envisioned. And what it turns out is that when you get a bunch of artists into a place sharing work for each other, um, other people want to pay to see that happen. And so Salih's bar takes off and he starts calling it a cabaret. Um, he becomes the first conferencier. He's not that great at it, but it doesn't matter because his artist friends include people like Satie and Debussy. Um, and he starts to attract some other people like uh, Artiside Bouant, who is um, a great MC as it turns out. And um, the art form takes off uh, and soon Montmartre becomes a desirable place to be. Um, people from the nobility, people from the bourgeoisie will come from Paris um, in part because they can drink for cheap, uh, but also because they are attracted by the artists who are there. And I think that that, um, and the artwork itself doesn't often directly deal with the traumatic events that had taken place 10 years before, although um, there are a few skits and sketches um, that happen. What does happen is that for one of the first times you have in Paris, you have people from the working class sitting at tables next to people from the bourgeoisie and they're all focusing on this art. And so suddenly they're having a conversation together um, that doesn't necessarily revolve around anything other than some silly songs that are being written. And so this idea is such a commercial success that it takes off really quickly and it spreads through Europe within like, five, first it spreads like down the street and there are copycats within, like literal copycats because they, they all keep using the name uh, a cat. Uh, and there, so there's some on the same street and then it starts to spread and it spreads to other countries in Europe. It goes to Germany and I think uh, Weimar is one of the chief places that we associate Cabaret with. Um, they take it over for themselves. Um, and I'm not going to go too much into the history that um, uh, from, uh, I'm going to skip over about 100 years of cabaret history, but before I do, I think there's a couple of lessons um, from the Chat Noir that I think are useful uh, now. Um, I think one of those is that uh, Sully gave complete uh, freedom, pr complete praetorial, uh, artistic freedom to the artists who were with him. Uh, there were enough boundaries given by the space itself um, and given by the society itself that he didn't need to lay down additional boundaries. Um, like the stage was about the size, it could only hold a piano. So there's only so much you can do when you have that much space. Um, and so it, it spurred creativity. I think another thing is that um, the spread of cabaret, I think identifies the value in replication of a successful idea. Um, cabaret has no shame in its, um, in uh, stealing from things that are working and iterating on those things if it works. And if it doesn't work, you can just wholesale steal it. Um, and as long as you're in your hyper 
uh, local community, um, it's new to the people who are coming. And I think another, I think another thing is that um, what the Chat Noir created more than anything else was a sense of community for the neighborhood, a sense of community for the artists who were performing, and a sense of community for the audience who eventually started showing up. They began to form an identity around the Chat Noir. Um, and that identity is what kept that, or that uh, space going for about 35 years um, from this bar into this um, artistic hotbed. Uh, but I'm going to jump ahead um, to the most recent resurgence of Cabaret. Uh, and I, I think one thing that's really interesting to me about Cabaret is that it, um, it blooms in places and then it dies and then it blooms again, sometimes in those same spaces, uh, sometimes with the same, even the same people, um, and sometimes in completely different places. And I feel like unlike theater, which I feel like has never maybe extinguished to the degree that Cabaret has, has extinguished at times, um, I think it is a hopeful thing that Cabaret can offer is that there have been many periods of um, dry spells in terms in Cabaret history. I think the most well known one is the um, uh, What happens at the end of World War II. Um, although that's it's not quite a as dramatic a cutoff as uh, the musical would have you believe uh, We can talk about that later. Um, anyway, so I want to jump ahead to the most recent resurgence of Cabaret because I think that there are some other great lessons in that. And that resurgence um, happens in the United States um, and it happens um, coming out of the AIDS crisis. And there are moments during that crisis and I think as a result of the culture wars um, where Cabaret goes dormant. And I believe that it goes dormant in part because uh, the term cabaret had come to mean something too frivolous. And so even artists who were using the form were calling themselves performance artists. Uh, so if you're looking for cabaret in the 80s, it might be under the label performance art. Um, but starting in the early 90s, there starts to be a resurgence. And I think some of that can be directly um, attributed to the artist Justin Vivian Bond um, and Viv's work with Kiki and Herb. Um, who kind of single-handedly bring it back, and they partially bring it back by just using the term cabaret and calling themselves a cabaret artist. Um, it also roughly coincides with the founding of Joe's Pub, which again, much like Le Chat Noir, gives a space for, um, for cabaret artists to perform, and it gives them great artistic license, um, which I think are two of the keys. Uh, anyway, I think one of the reasons why you see a resurgence at this moment, and it really takes off post 9-11, is because by this point, Cabaret has become a place where people can gather as a community and process their anxiety together in a space that is seemingly free from consequence, um, in a space in which you are sharing a space with what seem to be like-minded people, even if they're only like-minded for the evening. Um, it provides a space for self-reflection and conversation that can happen in the moment. And so you can process things that have happened that day, that week, that year. Um, you can process them under the guidance of somebody uh, who seems to be in control. Um, and I also think that self-reflection is always easier with a drink and Cabaret provides that too. Um, there's a concept in Cabaret that is um, coined by a Weimar era composer um, named Friedrich Hollander, uh, which is called the poison cookie, which is basically this idea that spectacle and pleasure um, can help people let down their boundaries enough to let um, more difficult ideas come in. And so what Cabaret allows is it allows for you to deal with the hard things, but deal with them through pleasure um, so that I think, I think about what Edwin is saying about how nobody thinks they want to see a tragedy, but they really, like, they really do need to deal with that. And I think that that is something that Cabaret answers by like dressing that tragedy up in uh, sequins and perhaps some big hair and a song. Uh, but it doesn't mean that the core of that tragedy isn't still present. Um, and that's the tension that Cabaret offers and I think can offer people in a time like this as well. I think the other thing that Cabaret offers, and I think about what Carrie was saying about the ways in which um, theater is perceived as a place uh, of transgression and how, how the danger of that transgression um, is also something that is attractive about it. 
Uh, and I think that that is something that Cabaret offers as well, is that it is a safe space for transgre transgression to happen. Um, and I think one of the other things uh, that is unique about Cabaret is that Cabaret takes place, so when you think about theater and traditional proscenium theater, uh, the audience has come to the performer's space. So that's part of the act of theater, um, is that you are coming to a space where you're going to see a performance. And cabaret doesn't take place in those spaces generally. It takes place in um, what my company likes to call designated spaces, which are designated integrated spaces, by which I mean they are spaces that are usually desig designated as not performance spaces. So they are bars or they are, um, in our case, the corner of lobbies, um, or they are under the theater building or they are church basements or they are um, halls that have been rented for activist reasons. Uh, and those spaces are integrated and turned into performance spaces by the cabaret artists, which at its most basic level means that the artists are coming into the audience's space. And that was true even in the Chat Noir. Um, even though there was a tiny corner stage, most of the bar, um, most of the bar was for the bar. Um, and I think we're in that, I think we're in that place right now as well. Like we are not only going into the audience spaces, we are literally going into their homes. Um, and we don't know how long we're going to be in their space. Um, but there's something that's really, I think, a great opportunity um, about being invited into that place. I think it, it requires um, care, uh, but it is also a kind of transgression that I think is, it can be exciting for people. Um, and it also can create an opportunity for a more honest conversation with your audience, um, even if that conversation is through a performance. Um, and of course, the weird thing about this is that at the same time, we're also being invited into performers' homes. And so I think that there's something exciting to me about that tension. Um, and finally, I think the last thing that I will, or I guess two last thoughts from Cabaret. Um, one is that Cabaret really values authentic mistakes and authentic failure. Um, Cabaret is a place where if your piano is off key, if the light comes crashing down in the middle of the show, that that is an opportunity for you to form a continued, uh, a dynamic relationship with your audience um, because you are having a real shared experience of failure. Um, and so I think treating, like I, I think about all of these technical glitches that are happening in all of these webinars. Um, and those are things that we are all experiencing uh, at the same time. And that actually helps bridge that performer um, audience uh, border in a way that I feel like especially in moments where we're not feeling connected, can help us feel connected. Um, and finally, I think one thing that has been interesting in this most recent um, resurgence of cabaret that has come out, of, um, come out of the AIDS epidemic and come out of uh, our response to 9-11 uh, is a recent, I would call say pivot in cabaret to authenticity, which is something that had been a piece of cabaret, but I would say never the most prominent part. And I think that that, that will, I'm curious to see after this moment, if that is still a trend um, that we see in cabaret. Uh, and a, an example of this is that um, Justin Vivian Bond uh, in the late, I, don't know, I think around 2008, uh, when Kiki and her breakup drops Kiki as a performance and starts performing as Justin Vivian Bond. Um, because Viv doesn't need the mask of Kiki anymore. And I, I'm curious to see if that has ramifications. Um, again, as we're like seeing into everybody's closet, do we want, are we going to want more authenticity? Are we going to want less authenticity? Um, yeah, so it, it's an interesting moment. And thank you for having me on the panel. And I'm excited to see what questions are out there. Um, there are some fabulous questions. And um, Sally, that I, I just love Sally's research. It's really um, some amazing stuff. And um, I don't know uh, if you wanted to share uh, the public research that you have out there, please feel free. Um, also, uh, I wanted to apologize if you see that there's a second box that says I'm here twice. Um, it's just because uh, I'm having uh, some tech fun in my house. Um, and so I, I apologize. And also, uh, I encourage you all to, uh, there's some genius uh, conversations going on both in the discussion and the Q&A. 
And if you're more adept uh, than I am at uh, uh, bouncing around from thing to thing, uh, please enjoy that. <laughs> I'm finding it a little stressful, but uh, you know, if you enjoy it, please enjoy it. Um, it uh, as I've said a couple of times, it's been such a thrill to uh, live with your guys' thoughts for the last couple of you know days as we've gone through this and looking for the connections of um, how we respond to things and sort of the uh, 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 resiliency is a strong word to use right now, but just sort of the the constant reemergence. And yes, my cat is back. Hi, hi Gracie. Say hi to everybody. Um, I was wondering in terms of now that we've all sort of heard each other's stuff, if there were um, connections that you all were making between each other's work. Oh, the cat has something to say about that. She's uh, a she is a, a failed poet, so I think she's gonna write a, a great pamphlet for Carrie. So <laughs> I would like to ask you, Julie, actually, thank you so much for sharing the the theater manifesto with us. Oh. That was a powerful piece to read in how you talk about theater community and how we can bring everything together in a in a kinder and more compassionate community how this crisis gives us an opportunity to reimagine the possibility of theater did you want to touch on that a little bit i'd like to hear some of your thoughts uh, uh no one paid to see me today um I will say, uh, yes, I, I, I did. I wrote a manifesto and a, a couple of you out there uh, read it already. I'll put it up on the base camp for NNPNs uh, for the conference uh, when I figure out how to do that. Um, and uh, I encourage all of you, uh, with living with these thoughts and just sort of as a historian, I, I think we all, <clears throat> I think I tend to look back a lot to sort of figure out the roadmap to where we might go. And I don't believe the history is cyclical. I, I just think that people often make the same mistakes. And so what are, what are the ways that we can make new mistakes, right? If we look at the mistakes from the past. So um, I, I wrote this manifesto and I will put it up. And I also encourage anyone out there um, it's a really fun practice to just let yourself get a little angry or outraged or pushy or crazy um, and just write what you hope this will be. This moment, these moments that we we're all talking about today of, um, of pause, of, of destruction and rebuilding, of uh, disappearance and reappearance. And I find that to be really terrifying and thrilling. And so how we can be in this moment of pause together and take a moment to contemplate, I think is really fun. And for me, it was really fun. Uh, the, those of you out there who know me in real life know that I live with a sense of simmering outrage uh, on the best of days, and these are not the best of days. So. Uh, please are, do write your own manifesto and I will put it up later. Um, and now back to our regular scheduled programming. Um, <laughs> um, in terms of making the connections between things, one of the things that we touched upon in our pre-conversations were um, sort of the, the silences and the forgetfulness, sort of the, the great human tendency towards amnesia about about uh, great events or great tragedies. And I was wondering if there was anything in there that you all wanted to, to touch on with that, just sort of bringing our previous conversations into the group. You're all One of the things that's, that strikes me, and I, I think it's connected to your question, Julie. I'll, well, I'll just say it and see if it connects. Um, I've been, <laughs> And, and this is also related to some of the things that I feel like are burbling up in the chat is like, you know, the question of what is um, 
forgotten willfully, you know, the big, like, you know, the desire to forget and that people choose to forget and what is um, repressed and dismantled. Um, you know, I think one of the things that I'm hearing through a lot of the uh, panelists is um, both theater as active resistance or active, um, you know, grasping joy out of, out of damaged times, but also the ways in which certain power structures pull away resources, pull away opportunity, pull away. Um, and so I guess I'm just like thinking about, um, yes, we, you know, we forget things, but how much are we actually forgetting and how much are we um, made to forget? If that makes sense. It does, yeah. Sally? Yeah, I also, this is maybe a slightly different direction, but I, I think in some of the conversations we were having um, and thinking about the ephemerality of cabaret, um, which we talked about a little bit, and like one of the challenges of cabaret is that it's meant to be a one night only in the room performance. And so it doesn't, it's not easily captured the way like a play from the Renaissance, like you have the play. Um, even if you don't have the performance, you have, you have some records. And, and then it occurred to me that I feel like even with all of these, even when the event itself is sometimes forgotten, what doesn't really get forgotten is the forms that are the forms that come out of it. The ways in which um, artists are experimenting with new, uh, new ways of making theater, new ways of, um, uh, you know, like bringing new audience performer relationships in, but and also just like just the ways in which they're playing with structure. Um, and sometimes symbolism and, and so I feel like and then those things inspire the next generation so I feel like even if the event itself is forgotten um, that something does come out of it that that lasts uh, even if that thing is divorced from um, the original content circumstances I was thinking <clears throat> listening to you um, less about the Renaissance plays and more about the anti-theatrical tracks themselves um, and one of their great tactics is they all plagiarize each other um, so pretty much every 10 years you have them going into, you know, whoever wrote before them and just, you know, pulling pull, full chunks into their texts. And then, you know, there's a lot of religious material um, that's put into these tracks and things like that. So even as recent as, you know, some of the anti-theatrical writing or speeches in the 1990s, there is sort of this almost like religious archive um, that exists because folks just keep plagiarizing themselves when they want to yell at the theater. Um, I don't know, it's just sort of interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, I think a lot about how much we forget and, um, and then that question or the, the, the thought about how it's actually incorporated in as we move forward, that it's sort of embedded. It's like that, that idea of uh, trauma being embedded in our DNA that we just, we, we continue carrying it forward. Um, and I, I think, um, I'm so curious, you know, that uh, the idea of how this moment can or should be captured. You know, cabaret is such an immediate form, right? So the idea would be to do something right now about it. And then the Greeks are such a metaphorical form or such a mythological form. So like, what are the, what are the ways uh, you would imagine this moment will be captured in the future? She's, she's sitting on my notes. <laughs> well, I do think, just building on what Sally was just saying, I mean, I think one of the things um, that will be interesting to see is, is formally how it impacts the way that we think about how we make work um, in terms of, you know, both how stories are told. You know, I think, I suspect that we will be thinking about these times and how we how we use the tools, you know, that we have to communicate, um, but also how we maybe rethink our relationship to our audience in new ways, which I feel like is also, you know, part of the thing that has come up in some of these um, questions is like moments of crisis is how do, who is our audience? How do we reach them? What do they need from us? How do we make that happen? Um, and so, you know, I, 
I'm the thing I'm really excited about is some of the formal stuff that might come from this, like how do we use technology in new ways, or how do we like reinvest in the liveness of performance? How do we rethink spaces and what theater spaces are? Like it feels like those are some of the things that I, I suspect will come out of it. But what I don't know, and I feel like this is something that you've been asking Edwin in some of our conversations is like the content itself and how much will we be actually reflecting on this moment in terms of as a story itself or how much will we just be taking the formal lessons we've learned um, but trying to shed the story at least in the short term. It seems like there's two contrasting stories about what people want to see in the drama. So in terms of remembering and forgetting, there's some people that want to go see dramas in the theater now to willfully forget what's going around them. And then there's a, another class of theater goers that wants to go to the theater to experience more of it, to, to learn about. So these would be the people that would perhaps have gone to see Sophocles' Oedipus Rex that was produced during the plague at Athens, where you go to the theater to, to re, revalue society's values and to, to use the stage as a place where you can simulate what the new world order looks like. But then there's people that want to go to see different types of dramas and uh, and to forget. So I see these two groups clashing a little bit. And it'll be interesting for the theaters to see what types of shows they'll produce coming up. Yeah, that, that idea is interesting to me. And I also feel like those two groups that you're talking about sometimes are actually are also the, the same person uh, over time. Um, because one thing that I have noticed, one thing that I, we see in cabaret history is that cabaret goes dormant during times of like big national crisis. So like during World War One, so it had flourished, it was huge. And then during World War One, everyone closes for those four or five years um, because nobody wants to go see something subversive and they don't want to work out um, there's a sense that people want to pull together in some ways. And so I, I also wonder if some of those people, if what they want right now is not to confront that, if that might change after this is over. Yeah. I, I, over I, being a relative term. I, I love that idea, Sally. So what I'm going to propose to the local theater here is that upstairs, they put on a serious drama, and then after that's over, we all go downstairs where the wine bar is open, the piano is playing, and the drinks are cold, and we go see the cabaret version of the serious drama. That's what the Russians did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, we, uh, let's not talk about the Russians. Um, the uh, there's an interesting question, uh, or there's a many, many interesting questions that we're actually going to run out of time for, unfortunately, um, uh, in the in the Q and A box. But one of the questions that we have is actually touching on one of the conversations that we've had. Um, and Carrie, I'm looking specifically at you of um, this question of uh, of the different ways that uh, pandemics affect different people, and how does that affect how they're remembered. Um, the question in the box is actually pointing to is a pandemic as big a crisis as a war or a, a similar crisis as a war. I'm, I'm paraphrasing and I'm sorry to the oh, question. No. But, um, but we, we, were, we were touching on that a little bit and I was wondering if you wanted to expand on it a little. Yeah, one, um, one thing that I don't know how much people know about the Black Plague, but when I was talking about the bills of, mor of mortality uh, and reporting the plague deaths, um, the Black Plague was called the Poor Man's Plague um, because the highest numbers were in the poor parishes. Um, but there was also a whole economy of wealthy folks paying off doctors um, to misreport their deaths as something else, um, to escape the city. Um, you know, the whole court leaves and during the worst parts of it. Um, so I think the question of is a pandemic, you know, on the same scale of trauma as a war, it depends 
who you are, I think, in that pandemic. Um, because it certainly had different impacts on different people. And it was tied to, you know, anti-theatrical prejudices also running alongside poor laws that are being introduced that basically criminalize uh, being poor or being homeless. Um, and so there's sort of a double, a double thing happening where they're sort of being denied resources, but also being lumped in with the cause. Like they are called pests or pestering. Um, the, the language of the London poor logs uh, actually calls poor people pests. Um, who are sickening the city. So I don't know if that necessarily answered the question, but I guess the question I would put yeah. back to the question is it depends who you are in a pandemic. Um, I wonder if that's part of it too, at least um, something that I've been thinking about for the last few years is, uh, you know, between the, the question of, of who gets valued as a hero in the stories that we tell and why, right? Like who gets centered in that role? The ideal, the ideal of Aristotelian drama having this one person or, or Joseph Campbell having this one person who is on the journey. And I think so much, you know, the, the 1918 research is so fascinating, right? Because it overlaps with the end of the war, which was this huge crisis and huge tragedy on an actually epic scale whereas the deaths from the flu were happening in private. So like that whole polis oikos private public conversation, um, is there a way to value the private in the same way that the public has been valued or is there a need for it? Is that, is that what our audiences desire? So. I used Greek and it made you all be quiet. <laughs> So um, we, uh, uh, my cat really did mess up all my notes. I was so, I was so prepared. Um, I'm wondering if, if in our own places, um, where, uh, sorry, there's, there's drama outside my door. Um, how do you think uh, theater, do you think that theater actually pr promotes change? Do you think theater simply reflects change? I can uh, jump in there. I, th I think you can do both. One thing that the Romans did when they went on their conquering spree across Europe, where, where they would uh, engage in a building policy. So wherever they conquered, they would build uh, a bath, a forum, and a theater. So the theater was a tool that they used to sort of bring peace to the conquered people. And then in that way, I would see theater as something as promoting a, a status quo. But then you can, you can use it for a change too. So I think it, I think it can do both. Sally, you had talked about something interesting of just sort of, uh, for, for lack of a stronger way of putting it, sort of the unintended consequences of things. Yeah, yeah, I think, um, and bolstered by the musical, uh, I think Cabaret likes to think of itself uh, as a catalyst for change um, and a catalyst for subversion and I think some of that is because it, it is set up against the status quo at its at cabaret at its base is a about um, an upending of traditional power dynamics in a lot of ways um, even if you're just looking at like who is on the stage if it's um, Elaine Stritch and she's you know in her 70s performing a one woman show that that is an upending of a traditional power structure that being said though I think that um, something that I think we see in the in the Weimar era um, are moments in which uh, cabaret can act as a sort of pressure release valve um, for people who might otherwise be so taken by their righteous anger that they maybe do action that that sometimes by gathering and and having that pressure release um, there's a question that I have about whether that release valve is actually Use, is it like actually promoting change or is it inhibiting change from happening? 
um, uh, one thing that I look at is um, in the pre-World War I uh, German cabaret era, uh, cabarets had to submit their scripts to censors, but mostly what got, very little got censored. And that was deliberate because the government and the police in particular understood the value of giving people a place where they could go and blow off steam um, because they found that it led to a reduction in, um, in I guess what, what they would consider anti-government movement. And so I, I do have some questions about the role of, um, the role of theater and like, if, even if we're pushing for change, uh, are we accidentally or unintended, unintentionally um, actually pushing complacency even with our most provocative material? Yeah, there's a, there's a great question in the Q&A um, just to, to build that of um, the idea that in the past, the most, ex the most exciting people, the people we're still talking about are the people who didn't shrink from risk and how much you all have sort of touched on risk uh, in your presentations today. And um, the idea of what do you think are ways that we could break down or the, the structures in place that reinforce the status quo that we're going to be forced to let go of, right? Like as much as we don't know what's going to come next, we know it won't be what it was before. And so how do you uh, imagine we could celebrate? I think it's, uh, yeah, it's Michelle Volansky's question, of course. Um, how can we, uh, break down the mechanisms that reinforce the status quo and instead celebrate the renegades. I'm sort of, uh, I'm sort of attempting to break down the status quo in the field that I do. So the risk theater model of tragedy is a new 21st century model of tragedy. And I'm inviting people to, what I hear is that playwrights, they say, we can't handle this catharsis. What is that? There's too many kings and queens in these old tragedies. We don't, we don't like tragedies. So I'm sort of trying to shake up the status quo by saying, let's make tragedy really cool as an exploration of risk. Everyone, because of events like the, uh, the current pandemic, because of events like the Great Recession, all these low probability, high consequence events really impact us on our lives. And if we, if we make that the fulcrum of dramas, I think they'll be really cool. So to answer your, your question, Julie, uh, yeah, I'm trying to take risks to change the status quo in literary theory. One of the things that I, <clears throat> I'm thinking about is just, um, you know, the thing that I found really inspiring in looking back at Hull House and Jane Addams, um, and it, this is sort of connected to your previous question too, Julie, the question of like, are we, is theater, um, you know, leading change or reflecting changes in the culture? And I think one of the things that I found very moving in reading about that is just that it felt like theater in that context was part of a series of solutions that had to do with providing resources, space, spiritual and physical, you know, balm for people in a community. And so that it was, um, it was leading change in the sense of, um, you know, providing human needs for um, people who were being denied many things. But that, you know, and, and so sometimes the, con like whether that all of the work being done was, you know, leading in new innovative directions or not, the sort of place of theater within that um, context was leading in terms of thinking about what theater can do and what it's for and who it's for and why it's there. Um, and so, Anyway, that I found that inspiring just in terms of thinking about the structures in which we put theater and the way that we think about why we're doing it and who we're doing it for and where it fits along all sorts of other needs that we have as human beings. I think that is a fantastic place for us to start wrapping this up. Um, you all are fantastic and I did very little work today, which is fantastic. Um, uh, Gracie Katz did far more work than I did. Um, Thank you all so much for your beautiful minds and your beautiful presentations and your beautiful thoughts.
Um, and I, I hope that uh, we can all share as much on Basecamp following this, and I'm sure Jess will have more information on how to share uh, further questions or information about things. And I'm going to toss it back to the beautiful and brilliant Nan Barnett. Oh, thank you. Thanks, guys, so much. That was fascinating. And I know it's going to inspire a lot more questions. So I want to point you to the base camp. Uh, both you as the panelist and for all of you who've been with us, please use that Basecamp site, the one that's specifically for this event, to uh, continue to post your questions and your thoughts and share other resources that uh, people might find uh, useful. Uh, just a gigantic thank you to you, Julie, and the four of you as panelists. It's just fascinating. I, I've been making some notes for myself about phrases that really resonated. And I know we've been seeing those uh, come up in the chat as well. Uh, a reminder that this session has been recorded and will be available later on. We'll let you know about that. And for those of you that are joining us for the member theater uh, only pitch session, we'll be beginning at 445. So you'll be getting the link for that. And if you are coming along with us tonight to Chicago's Prop Theater's presentation of Olivia Lilly's, oh, that's a doozy, Diary of an Erotic Life. Um, we will be sending out the link for that about an hour before we begin. And you will also at that point get the playbill that will have all the information about the artist that we'll be working with tonight. So we hope you'll join us for that. Please remember to pin your uh, conference program so you have access and know where all of that information is. Thank you so much for joining us on behalf of everyone here at NNPN. Again, our one thanks and have a great rest of your afternoon. And we'll see some of you later on and hopefully later during the week. Thanks very much, everybody. See you soon.